Hope everyone's having a wonderful holiday season. And today we're going to be revisiting this awesome looking integral, but we're going to solve it using a much cooler approach than before. As always, we call the integral i. And I'm going to introduce some complex analysis here. So according to that wonderful formula by Euler, e to the i times t, where i is the imaginary unit, of course, this equals the cosine of t plus i times the sine of t. Now, if I replace t by the natural log of x, then we have, uh, the right on the right-hand side, we have the cosine of the natural log of x plus i times the sine of the natural log of x. And we can use a property of the natural logarithm whereby this i coefficient uh, becomes an exponent of the uh, argument of the natural logarithm. So we have e to the natural log of x to the i on the left hand side and this equals the cosine of the natural log of x plus i times the sine of the natural log of x. Now it's the sine term that we're interested in, right? So we see that we can write the sine of the natural log of x as the imaginary part of e to the natural log of x to the i. Now the e and the natural log just cancel out. So you're left with the imaginary part of x to the i. So we can write our integral as the integral from 0 to 1, and we had this sine term in the numerator, and that is just x to the i, the imaginary part, that is, of x to the i, and we have to divide it by the natural log of x, and we're integrating with respect to x, of course. Now, this particular kind of integral can be solved quite easily using Feynman's technique, uh, also known as the Leibniz rule. Yes, everyone knows that. Everyone knows that. And, of course, it's just a differentiation under the integral sign, right? So let's define our integral function i of some parameter a. And now, where exactly should we place the parameter in the, uh, in the function that we're integrating? So let's take note of our problem here. Well, the main problem is being caused by the natural log of x term in the denominator. So if I get rid of this, that would make my life so much more easier, right? So how can I get rid of this natural log of x term? Well, if you remember all the derivatives that have natural logs in them, you would remember that if you differentiate with respect to some variable x, some constant to the power of x, this equals the same term a to the x times the natural log of a. So I'm going to need something like this here. Now, as per Feynman's technique, we have to differentiate with respect to the parameter. In this case, the parameter is what we call a. So if I differentiate x to the a, and I have an i term here as well, so let's just put it there. If I differentiate something like this, holding x as a constant, so I should use the partial derivative as we will have later. So holding x constant and differentiating with respect to a, I will have x to the i times a times the natural log of x times uh, i. Okay? So, yeah. This could work. In fact, this will work. So now we know exactly where we want our parameter. We want it as part of the exponent of the uh, x term in the numerator. And now we can differentiate with respect to this parameter a. And now the golden question, can we switch up the order of the integration and the differentiation operators? Well, I don't see any problems with convergence whatsoever. So yes, we can switch up the order of integration and differentiation. So we're now integrating from 0 to 1. And once you perform this switch up, the total derivative with respect to a becomes a partial derivative with respect to a. And so we're integrating from 0 to 1, the partial derivative with respect to a of x to the i times a divided by the natural log of x. And integration is with respect to x, x of course. So once you perform this uh, differentiation, uh, you're differentiating with respect to a, keeping x as a constant, right? So this 1 by the natural log of x term is just a constant, and you now have x to the i times a times the natural log of the constant base x times uh, 
times this i term as well. So let's just write it up here. And uh, oh dear me, much better, much better. So the natural log of x is cancel out and that removes our headache. Yeah, now we have to just integrate from 0 to 1 i times x to the i times a with respect to x. So we're integrating completely in the x world, meaning the a is just a constant. So all you have to all you have to do now is use the power rule. So this is in fact really simple as you can see. So the Feynman technique or the Leibniz rule has made our life much easier. So yeah, this was really cool. This was really cool. So applying the power rule and plugging in the uh, the limits of integration, you now need the imaginary part of i times um, 1 times 1 to something is just 1, right? So i divided by i a plus 1, and you have a 0 later. So, okay, now what? Now what? You need the imaginary part of this complex number here. And how are you going to get that? Notice one. Notice that we have a complex number in the denominator, and we can expand this using the complex conjugate. So upstairs, we multiply by the complex conjugate, and we do the same downstairs. And of course, we have that classic relation, the identity where a plus b times a minus b is a squared minus b squared. Yeah, standard stuff. And of course, we can multiply using the distributive property and that means upstairs we're going to have i squared a minus i. Now, utilizing the fact that i squared equals negative 1, we have negative a minus i upstairs and negative a minus 1 downstairs. And, of course, you can cancel out the negative signs and you're left with uh, the imaginary part of a plus i divided by, oh, there was a square term here. Yeah, sorry about that. Divided by a squared plus 1. So you want the imaginary part of this complex number, which is obviously 1 by 1 plus a squared. So this is the derivative of i with respect to the parameter a. Now that we have the derivative of i with respect to a completely in terms of the parameter a, we want to recover the function i back from its derivative. And the drill for that is pretty easy, right? All we have to do is integrate with respect to the variable a. Now, I like to use definite integrals at this stage. So let's take a moment to look back at the integral function i of a, which was the imaginary part of the integral from 0 to 1 of x to the i times a, divided by the natural log of x. Now, the case we were interested in, or our target case, was a equal to 1, right? And so that's one limit of integration, but what about the other limit? Well, let me show you something really cool. If you use, uh, if you plug in a equals 0, you have the imaginary part of the integral from 0 to 1, the denominator becomes x to the 0, which is 1, right? So we have 1 by the natural log of x, and integration is with respect to x, of course. Now, here's, now here is the really cool bit. You're integrating a real valued function of x, right? Irrespective of whatever the integral um, converges to or does not converge to, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. What matters is that you're integrating something in the real number system. So the imaginary part is always going to be zero. So yeah, that is pretty cool. So we have two limits of integration, zero and one. Lower limit zero, upper limit one. So this implies on the left hand side we have i of one minus i of zero, which is zero anyway, equals the inverse tangent of a with zero and one as the limits of integration. This implies that i equals pi by four, and yes, that was awesome. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to like and subscribe. Thank you. See you next time.